Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I must say it's a pleasure to be here at an ABARES Outlook conference uh, speaking, but not having the weight of the organisation leaning on my shoulders. Um, I think a lot of the messages that uh, Matt's just talked about are very similar to the messages that I'm going to give you this morning. Um, I think we both know, perhaps we all know, that uh, agriculture has a great future in Australia, and the reason we know that is because everyone keeps talking about its problems just heard a lot of the problems from, uh, from Matt, but we've also heard some of the solutions. And we hope from the white paper we get to hear a lot more of those solutions, and then eventually the government implements them. As Matt said a number of times, um, we know that there are a lot of opportunities out there for agriculture. Jamie explained quite a number of them during his speech. Uh, but we also know, as Matt said, that uh, they won't just fall in our lap like manna from heaven. It's going to take a lot of hard work, smart decisions, strategic investment, sound policies and solid commitment. The Agriculture White Paper represents the government's input into turning the opportunities into a reality. Now, a White Paper is a forward-looking policy document. It will be a statement of government policy rather than a report that the government needs to respond to. The Agriculture Competitiveness White Paper will outline a clear strategy to improve the competitiveness and profitability of the agricultural sector. Minister, Minister Joyce has made it clear, and he made it clear again this morning, that a key objective for the White Paper is to increase returns at the farm gate. Higher returns to farmers will promote higher production, improve the value of exports, and contribute to growth in regional communities and to the national economy. Now, the terms of reference for the White Paper were released last December. They are very broad ranging, covering all aspects which are likely to affect the competitiveness of the sector, from natural resources and climate that underpin our farm production, through labour, energy, capital and other inputs, research and development, processing, freight logistics and final markets as well as issues that relate to food security and also to our regional communities. So just about anything you can think about that might affect the competitiveness of agriculture is included in the terms of reference. Now we released a issues paper. Um, if I can get this thing to work. There we go. Um, so we released an issues paper in early February. And uh, that issues paper expands on the terms of reference and provides um, uh, a further detail in terms of the sorts of things that the government is interested in knowing about and some of the questions it would like answered. This issues paper opened the opportunity for submissions and also consultations with, with stakeholders. We've commenced a, a process of consultations, of visiting around 33 regions uh, throughout Australia. Um, and that's going to occur over the next couple of months. So we invite anyone who wishes to speak to us to contact us to arrange an appointment and uh, the dates of our visits to those various places around Australia and the contact details are available on our, on our website. And that's listed on the slide there. Uh, we, also got a, we also have a stand here um, just outside the Royal Theatre over the next couple of days so people can talk to our staff and also there's a computer there if you want to put your thoughts uh, straight into, uh, into the process. Now, for the rest of my presentation today, I, I want to talk a bit about competitiveness and how to achieve it. Um, we've already heard quite a bit about that from Matt, and uh, we also know that there are many definitions of competitiveness. Uh, Matt just gave a definition which was uh, the ability to sell goods in a market uh, relative to the ability and performance of others. Uh, which is a good definition. Uh, I also heard another defi definition from an experienced and well-known agricultural economist who told me recently that competitiveness simply meant lower costs and higher revenues, which is a down-to-earth definition and certainly what we're talking about. Uh, we've got a more sort of higher level strategic definition of competitiveness. Uh, and we define it as the ability to efficiently use a nation's land, water, human and other resources to achieve sustainable improvement in the standard of living for all Australians and growth in profit for our businesses. Now, this is a definition both about now and also about the future. It's about maximising the wellbeing of society over the long run. 
a competitive market-based system with industry responsible for its decisions and government setting the right environment is recognised as the best way of achieving this. Remembering, of course, that competitiveness is only a means to an end, which is better returns for farmers and better outcomes for the community. So how do we achieve it? Well, given uh, Australia exports over 60% of the agricultural output it produces and a much greater proportion for some products, it could reasonably be argued that Australia is able to compete against the best farmers in the world already. Uh, because of the size of our country, its geographical spread across a range of climate zones and the range of our agroecological environments, Australia can produce a wide diversity of extensive and intensive agricultural products. We also have a stable democratic system of government, a competitive market-based economy, sound financial system, a developed domestic market, educated community, and we have a biosecurity system that supports our animal and plant health and food safety. We have many of the strengths, indeed, that are necessary for our industries to thrive and to take advantage of the well-known growth opportunities in overseas and domestic markets. It's not surprising then that uh, many overseas companies want to actually invest in our processes and our farms. If the objective is to double food production over the next 40 years to 2050, then these strengths will hold us in good stead. Now, if we look back over the last 40 years, we have managed to double the volume of production in Australia over that time, as shown as this on this graph based on uh, ABARE's production volume index. A doubling again over the next 40 years, of course, presents a much bigger challenge in terms of the absolute amount of additional products needed. Through our early public consultations, we are hearing of many of the challenges that are needed to be addressed to better position us to take advantage of these future opportunities. Matt covered many of the themes that we have also been hearing, but some of the themes that we're hearing to date include things like uh, the regulatory burdens that impose high costs on our producers relative to producers in other countries, the costs of inputs such as energy and capital costs, and the lack of flexibility in labour rates, uh, particularly uh, to reflect the seasonal nature of farming and processing, the variability of market prices, uh, the infrastructure needed to support growth, including water, road and rail infrastructure, uh, the cost of getting product from the farm gate to the final market, including processing costs and margins through the supply chain, uh, research development, extension and training needed to support productivity improvement, uh, the difficulties for new entrants to agriculture, uh, market access barriers in overseas markets, uh, social issues as well, such as a lack of community recognition of the value of farmers and their produce, and environmental issues in managing the land, soil and our climate, including drought. As I say, many of these issues are well known and have been uh, covered before, including in um, the National Farmers Federation blueprint. We'll be drawing on that work that's been done before to help inform our processes, but we're also interested in hearing the latest on, on those issues and, and any new issues. Well, the challenges we're hearing in agriculture are reflected in the value of production. In gross terms, in terms of the gross value of production, we have seen an increase in the value of production over the last uh, four decades or so, even after adjusting for inflation. However, if we remove costs from the equation, which is the net value of production, the red line on the graph, we see that uh, the real net value of production has been relatively flat over that period. And in part, that reflects a cost price squeeze that farmers are well aware of. Now, if we are to achieve improved profitability for farmers and provide the incentives for production to rise, we need to address the issues that, are, that create this squeeze for farmers. Now, Karen, in her speech, Karen Schneider, in her speech this morning, raised a number of suggestions, uh, such as deregulation, infrastructure improvements, and uh, in, uh, continued investment or increased investment in R&D. And uh, Matt, in his presentation, also provided uh, many examples of things that we need to do. So, to some extent, we do know some of the solutions to the problems and we'll be looking at those very carefully through the uh, white paper process. I wanted to touch on uh, another issue um, as well, and that's perhaps something that, uh, that farmers can also do and the industry can also do or look at. That's relating to the uh, business structure of farms. 
uh, through our consultations, we're seeing quite a few signs of change in what might be regarded as a more traditional business structure in Australian agriculture. And I think some of those changes could very well hold our farmers in good stead for the future. There are many new business models for farming that are being developed and they may provide very good examples or models for others. Some of them are looking at on-farm risk spreading models such as share farming, which obviously has been around a long time, but uh, farmers are starting to look at that again, as well as seeking equity investors. Uh, these, these models, particularly things like share farming, are helping new entrants to come into agriculture with lower capital needs than ownership of a farm would require. We met one farmer who had um, a model where he leased part of his land, he shared risks by working closely with a processing company on another part of his land, and he ran his own livestock fattening business on another. He was also carefully managing rotations to maintain the fertility of his farm overall. Some farmers are also diversifying their business uh, activities to spread the risk from a variable farm income to off-farm activities that are providing a more uh, stable income source and perhaps one which is less weather dependent, or to spread their risk by owning farms across a number of geographical areas. We've also found farmers who are looking more closely at the market demands of their customers. We have examples of farmers who are moving up the value change, uh, chain to uh, capture some of the margins along the supply chain or to develop some of their own local brands. In other cases, they um, are working to ensure that they are producing products which maximise the value to the final consumer by making sure they have a close connection with the uh, buyers in the marketplace. Now, while each farmer will need to make their own decision on the best use of their land and labour, providing examples of some successful approaches that are working out there at the moment that offer a new business approach to farming may well help farmers improve their competitiveness as well. So to conclude, uh, the objective in working with industry and government through the white paper process is to improve the situation in the agricultural sector. Ultimately, it's to reduce the costs and to increase the revenues to develop policies that will help to advance the profitability and the competitiveness of the sector. We're using the consultation process to help develop policy options that will assist us in addressing these and other issues that people raise. As I noted at the start, we invite anyone who wishes to speak to us to contact us to arrange an appointment. Our submissions for our process are due by the 17th of April and can be made directly through our website by email or, or by mail and we look forward to your contributions during the process. Thanks very much.